Welcome to Digital Asset News, the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets, and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, we've only got one story, and it's a article that really makes you think about the associations between Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, digital assets, and the real world. And it's the article titled, How Bitcoin is Like Ham Radio. And we're going to go over a lot of different things, and it's going to get pretty deep. And we're going to go over things that uh, just happened recently, where Bitcoin transaction records are not protected by a Fourth Amendment, uh, U.S. court rules. But... We're going to get into all those things and more in just a bit. But first, let's take a look at the market. So it is July 5th. It is roughly uh, 1030 Texas time. And it looks like Bitcoin is pretty much trading sideways yet again, 9,038. Not really too much going on. I think it's been dipping below 8,000 here and there, or in the, the 8,000 level, but nothing really fantastic. Uh, Ethereum 225, Tether's Tether, XRP, XRP. Bitcoin Cash Cardano is slipping into that sixth spot as of yesterday after that huge announcement, which we took a look at, that states that Coinbase is going to be doing the custody service for Cardano, which really means that Cardano is going to be listed on Coinbase. And there's a little bit of a dip today at 2.6%, uh, but still, uh, I see big things for Cardano coming up. Uh, Bitcoin SV, Litecoin, Crypto.com now in the number nine spot. So uh, interesting things are happening, but not really too much going on. It's a Sunday, so let's just jump right in. So first and only up, I came across this article and I wasn't really going to talk too much about it, but as I read it again and again and again, it's just there were some things in there that made a lot of sense that would actually help us answer some questions moving forward. And you'll you'll understand what I mean in a second. So the article is titled How Bitcoin is Like Ham Radio. This is by JP Coning, Conning, Coning. Um, and I was like, well, who's this guy? Uh, JP Coning, a, he's a column, columnist, worked as an equity researcher at a Canadian brokerage firm and as a financial writer at a large Canadian bank. He runs the popular uh, Moneyness blog. So uh, he knows, you know, what he's talking about. He's got some uh, different points of opinion. And uh, but it was fascinating to, to go over it and just kind of peel back all the layers uh, that he was talking about. So basically, the first paragraph lays it all out. Uh, you know, it says Bitcoin is old. Uh, it takes days to download the Bitcoin blockchain, just like it took forever to download software back in 94. And I can remember those days. It sucked. Uh, the internet took forever. But uh, these days, a little bit quicker. And it goes on to state, in an age of instant email and real-time Zelle payments, a Bitcoin transfer takes 60 minutes to safely settle. It's more volatile than gold. Thousands of computers are constantly replicating each other's work making it vastly inefficient. And lastly, there's no privacy. Like a medieval marketplace, anyone can see everybody's holdings. So I know you're right now screaming at the screen because you're like, that's that's ridiculous and I can't believe he said that. But in honesty, uh, every single point there is right. Uh, there's just different levels and different layers of what is correct and how we uh, disseminate that information. So when you are talking to, and the reason, well, actually, I'm going to say this. The reason why I brought this about is because these types of arguments are going to come up. So as time goes on, I believe that 2020 and 2021 are going to be big years for crypto current digital assets. So I try to educate people as much as possible. And these types of arguments are going to come up. So I think what better way than to talk about them now and bring them out in the open uh, so we can have that discussion, right? So the basic thing is this, when these types of things happen and you are you know, presented with these uh, arguments, really what you have to take a look at is, uh, you know, how much of this is true and just kind of break it down uh, layer by layer. So let's break down each point. So first up, Bitcoin is old. That, that's true. I mean, if you want to look at, well, I guess if you want to compare it to gold, it's like just, uh, you know, just scratching the surface because Bitcoin is only about 10 years old. But uh, as far as like technology goes, uh, a 10 year old computer, I don't think we'd ever really, you know, deal with that, especially not a Microsoft computer. Those computers suck. Uh, but if you are looking at like a, a decade old computer, that's old technology. That's a decade old. Uh, we don't usually use that unless you want to use Swift, which is like 40 years old, but whatever. So in that part, yes, it's true. However, even though it's old, it's battle tested. It's been through a lot of ups and downs and it's never been hacked. So if we look at like that part, you're like, well, it is old, but you know, it's dependable. So if you want to trade, do a trade off, sure. Next part is it takes days to download the Bitcoin blockchain, just like it took forever to download software back on four. And I was like, I have never actually taken a look and seen how long it would take to download a full node. Now, I don't know what your status is. If you are super into Bitcoin and running a node, then you know this answer. But I think 
uh, for the majority of us, I'm just guessing here, uh, you watching the video, you might not know how long it takes to download a full node. So let's take a look real quick and how long it takes to do that. So first of all, what's a full node? Full node is a program that fully validates transactions and blocks. Almost all full nodes also help the network by accepting transactions and blocks from other full nodes, validating those transactions and blocks, and then relaying them further full nodes. So that was kind of boring, but uh, let's get to the good stuff. So down, down, down. This is how much it would take to download a full node. Uh, 200 gigabytes of free space, uh, accessible at a minimum, read write speed of 100 megabytes per second. An unmetered connection, a connection with highly high upload limits, or a connection you regularly monitor, uh, doesn't exceed the upload. It's common for full nodes and high-speed connections to use 200 gigabyte uploads or more a month. Download usage is around 20 gigs, uh, plus an additional 195 the first time you start your node. And you need about six hours per day that the full node can be left running. So look, if you're going to download a full node, it's going to take a while. I mean, I was going to tell you, that's a, that's a lot. That is a huge amount of data to actually download. So in that respect, uh, when he says here, it takes forever to download. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, if we want to download like an MP3, uh, any kind of like streaming service or, you know, like a song or whatever else, it's relatively quick. Let's be honest. Uh, but if we're talking about like a full node, it, it, in today's world, it would be like forever. And then he states, in an age of instant email and real-time Zelle payments, which is what we're all used to, a Bitcoin transfer could take or takes 60 minutes to safely settle. That is also true. So if we take a look at, you know, how long it would take to settle transactions, uh, usually it's actually six. Six confirmations are able to settle that Bitcoin transactions. And if we take a look at Kraken, um, they say pretty much the same thing. So if you don't know, what are confirmations? When a transaction is broadcasted to the network, it has to wait to be included in a block by the miners. When the transaction has been included in a mine block, the transaction has received one confirmation. With each subsequent block, the number of con confirmations increase for the transaction. So uh, just so you know, a, a block is mined every 10 minutes. So if it's take six, let me do some quick math here. Six times 10 is 60. Check my math. 60 minutes, uh, that should be right. And then it further states, to avoid the risk of double spending, funds aren't credited or settled until a certain number of confirmations have taken place. See the list below. And they actually give you a list of all the different types of uh, cryptocurrency digital assets and how many confirmations are required. So uh, Bitcoin Cash, and correct me if I'm wrong in the description, but uh, this is what it has for Kraken, which is 15 confirmations, which takes two and a half hours. And then, uh, of course, just Bitcoin uh, six confirmation, which would be 60 minutes. So uh, in this regard, uh, again, uh, he is correct. However, I will say this, um, in the when he talks about the, the age of Zelle and all those different things about how fast it actually is, Zelle in the United States is one of the fastest ones that we have, and it's pretty much instant, uh, you know, it just goes bank to bank. And the problem with Zelle, uh, and me as a small business owner, is I can't pay uh, other businesses uh, per se, when I have large transactions. So if you're just doing like, and this is, and every bank is different. So like Ali, you can do up to 500 bucks a day. Bank of America, Capital One Chase, it's around 2,000, 2,500. So that's fantastic. However, if you're paying, you know, good amount of money, as far as businesses go, uh, you're not using Zelle. So like for me and my manufacturers, uh, I have a manufacturer. Uh, well, I used to have one in China. I don't use China anymore. I uh, have one in India and then I also have one in Arizona. And just to pay the one from Arizona to use my bank, uh, it has to go through a wire transfer because it's much more than 5000 or much more than 2500 And uh, I've talked about this before. So I am... The, the faster I get things out, the better it is for my business and the better, better it is for every business out there. I mean, time is money. So I went to uh, pay my manufacturer on a Friday. I put the wire transfer in. They didn't get to it until late. They said, yeah, hit the cutoff date. So I had to wait Friday. Then Saturday and Sunday, banks are not working. Then on Monday, they finally got around to around three or four. Manufacturer called me up, said, hey, we received the funds. And then on Tuesday, they shipped everything out. So I'm waiting uh, essentially five days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then Tuesday. So four or five days. And if that happens once a month or every couple months, when I have to pay for these uh, um, products, uh, I'm, lo I'm losing uh, about a month after, you know, or more after about a year of just time that I just wasted because of the banks and their inefficiencies. So when he talks about Zelle, yes, peer-to-peer -peer and retail, that type of thing, sure. We're talking about businesses. It is woefully inefficient. And uh, that's where I believe cryptocurrency digital assets are going to rule.
Now, next he states it's more volatile than gold. And again, very true. Gold only goes uh, up and down very slowly. However, when we're talking about um, value and uh, how the markets actually react, volatility is actually a good thing. For, so for Bitcoin in general, uh, it is very volatile. However, uh, as far as 2020 goes, and this was a little bit old, this I think was done in uh, May by Tom Lee. Um, he takes a look at what is the year-to-date return. And so far, uh, Bitcoin has beat US Treasuries and gold you know, from 39 to 12.5. Uh, also the NASDAQ, uh, S&P 500, uh, loans, I mean, world topics, I mean, oil, everything you can think of, it's kicking the tar out of it. And that's just this year. Now, I don't know what's gonna happen at the end of the year. However, we take a look uh, in history, just one year back, Bitcoin beat NASDAQ, S&P 500, or else 2000 gold topics, oil, everything else uh, by a large margin. So yes, it is volatile, uh, but that's okay. If you're making money, I don't think you care so much about the volatility. And uh, that's one of the things. Now, if we want to take a look back even farther. Let's take a look at, you know, the last decade or so. Uh, so from 2011 all the way up to now, uh, there's been a pretty good return. And yes, it's been, you know, wildly volatile. If you're like, man, this is this 1,468% 1, gain in 2011 is just too volatile for me, then maybe it's time to get out. Uh, not to say there hasn't been downturns, 2014 and 18 being the exception, uh, but overall, not too bad. And if you've invested in other altcoins like I have, uh, you've done pretty well. It just depends on when you got in. So volatility, sure. So next he states that uh, thousands of computers are constantly replicating each other's work, making it vastly inefficient. And again, that is also true. So when we talk about, talk about decentralization, that's the whole beauty of having uh, thousands and thousands of nodes. So we take a look at, this is from bitnodes.io. We can definitely see that, yeah, there is uh, 10,000 plus nodes throughout the entire globe. We can see most of these are in definitely America, parts of South America, Asia, and Australia. So when you have these many nodes and it takes you know a long time for transactions, things like that, there is a little piece of inefficiency that is true. However, it is also much safer. And we all know the different aspects of decentralization. And I can just tell you this, if you have just, I don't know, one node and that node gets wiped away, well, everything is essentially gone. And that's actually happened uh, when I was a director of nursing, uh, one of my different uh, branches, uh, they stored everything on one computer and what happened when they had a flood, uh, all those medical records were essentially gone. Now, this is before uh, we had cloud computing and everything else. Remember, I'm kind of old. So these things, that's not so great, especially when we're talking about centralization versus decentralization. So yeah, it takes a little bit more time, but wow, it's a little bit more uh, safer. So then moving forward, we might also take a look at sharding and how that's all going to affect the cryptocurrency digital asset space, especially with Ethereum, uh, coming up with Ethereum 2.0 and Zilliqa also doing it. So uh, we'll see how it all works out and how efficient it actually makes it. This one is very interesting. It says, and lastly, there's no privacy. Like a medieval marketplace, anyone can see everybody's holdings. And uh, there on this channel, there is a wide swath of people. There is on one side, it is chaos and anarchy rules just do whatever you want and that's fine and uh, that's just what it is on the other spectrum are people who are like let's shut it all down china communism and we need to have like a surveillance state but i think the majority of people are like me and they're somewhere in the middle wherever that's on like a left medium or, or, or right it doesn't matter uh, i just think that that's what a lot of people are maybe you are probably in that middle so i think with transactions and things being private uh is sometimes good but for a lot of the large corporations and i can think of like enron and bernie madoff if they would have had uh, more transparency maybe we wouldn't have the collapse uh, of those individuals and corporations conglomerates that actually happened and uh, took a lot of people down with it so that's just my opinion but there's another flip side to that and i think this is going to start a lot of debate this was a um, article that just came out yesterday Bitcoin transaction records not protected by the Fourth Amendment U.S. court rules. So real quick, the Fourth Amendment in the United States, it prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. So now, and I think this has always been the case, uh, the government or anybody else can take a look at your um, transactions, especially if you have them on an exchange. So it goes on to state the Louisiana court issued the ruling in connection with the case against Richard Gratkowski, who was sentenced to 70 months in federal prison last year after paying for access to child pornography websites using cryptocurrency. And before we start to go and say, oh, you're fear mongering and da da da, this is a real case. This is actually going on. And uh, 
uh, when you have these types of things, I, I know some people are like, hey, you know, let it all open and that's fine. And we should just let, you know, people be people and blah, blah, blah. But when you have these types of instances and you're trying to track down illegal activity, uh, there is a little tit for tat, there's a little give and take. And I believe that you should be able to do this. I mean, if we don't, if we don't, we have people just running amok. And again, that goes back to the uh, chaos and anarchy. If you're on that side, you're on that side. But I don't think anybody on this channel can get behind what this person is doing. So I'll just leave it at that. But it goes on to state, the FBI subpoenaed crypto exchange Coinbase to track his payments to the illicit websites. And that's how they were able to arrest him. But in his appeal, Gretkowski argues that he has reasonable expectation of privacy in his crypto transactions. Although he believes the law enforcement violated his Fourth Amendment rights, when they seize his records, the panel of judges ruled that the FBI agents acted accordingly. And this is why. They stated, Bitcoin users have the option to maintain a high level of privacy by transacting without a third party intermediary. But that requires technical expertise, so Bitcoin users may elect to sacrifice some privacy by transacting through an intermediary such as Coinbase. Gradkowski thus lacked a privacy interest in the records of his Bitcoin transactions on Coinbase, and that's essentially it. They said, look, if you have the expertise and you want to go that route, you could, but you didn't use the intermediary, which is Coinbase, which is why we got those records, which is why you're busted, which is why you're going to jail. So in all honesty, uh, I will say this uh, for Coinbase. I uh, have not recommended Coinbase for a little bit of time now because of their shutdowns. They've had three shutdowns in four months, and it always happens when Bitcoin you know, pumps or, or goes lower. So I think that it's just not acceptable that an $8 billion company keeps having these same issues and their customer service is uh, beyond awful. That's that. Those are two issues. The third issue is that they also have signed an agreement with the IRS and the DEA, which to look at different transactions. And that's fine. I just kind of think to myself, well, look, if you're going to, if you're going to allow um, subpoenas to happen, which they can, this is just, this is it. You know, if I, if, if I am on uh, a watch list for like illicit activities and they want to do a subpoena, okay. So that's one thing. But if I have to go through the KYC, if I have to go through the AML, if I have to get a 1099, which I pay my taxes, and I've been doing this since I was a 15 year old kid, how many more hoops do we got to jump through? And it just seems like just more and more and more and more. If you need something, get a subpoena. Okay. Go through the courts like that. And that's the reasons why I'm not on board with Coinbase right now. Those are three reasons. However, I am going to change my stance at some point because we have to choose the lesser of two evils. And I think when the bull run happens, the parabolic bull run happens, we're going to need an off-ramp. And you can use a bunch of different places. You can use Kraken. You can use Gemini. You can use Binance if you have that ability in, uh, in US. I don't. I live in Texas, and uh, they don't allow that in Texas. So I need to keep my options open. And uh, I think at some point, I will have to use them as an off-ramp. So that's one of those caveats. Anyhow, let's get into the, uh, the meat and potatoes of this article. So like ham radio, Bitcoin is for hobbyists. I'm not talking here about the frantic speculators who keep their coins at Coinbase, which we just talked about. I'm talking about the users who can run a full node, use Lightning, securely store their own coins, and make frequent transactions with this stuff. So uh, I think the majority of people on this channel, we don't buy a lot of things with Bitcoin. I mean, maybe you do, I don't know. Uh, but I don't run a full node. I don't buy things with Bitcoin. I'm you know, storing it on my nano ledger, and that's pretty much it. So and he's talking about the people who are like the hobbyists, just like the ham radio people. So going on, he states, only a, hobbyist ha only a hobbyist has the time and patience to master the skills that qualify them as a Bitcoiner. Same goes for ham radio. Setting up a ham radio, scanning frequencies and finding the local repeater, all take time and effort to master. So just so you don't know, this is a ham radio, this little goofy thing right here. It uses a very little amount of uh, electricity and you can, you can uh, transmit signals and people can pick these up. They're very popular back in the day. I mean, they're still, well, I guess, somewhat popular, but people don't use them near as much. However, that's what they actually are. Then he states, Bitcoiners dream about mainstream adoption and achieving hyper Bitcoinization. That's a good word. The overthrow of fiat currency by Bitcoin. But this is unlikely for the same reason ham radio has never gone mainstream because people want fun and simple to use iPhone, not an archaic ham radio. And I got to say, that's true. <laughs> it is, it is. So people embrace the Internet was it when it wasn't so technical in the beginning. I mean, before even Netscape and things like that, no one was using the internet. No one was using, no one wanted to set up all the different things and TCP IP and all those different, I mean, no one was writing code, okay? It only took off 
when all that stuff was hidden and my mom could use it. When, when my mom can use Bitcoin, it'll take off. That's all I'm saying. And people don't, don't care about protocols. Like I said, uh, nobody wants to see how the sausage is made. I just want the sausage. So uh, again, crypto will take off. My mom's able to use it. That's how I know it's going to go mainstream, uh, not to where it is right now. I mean, look, you have to copy like a you know 26 character code and you kind of hope it gets there and using an NL ledger. I mean, it's it's different. It's just it's just different. I mean, we've got to hide all that stuff and make it just super simple. And that's when it'll take off. So now he's going to talk about some things about disasters, and this kind of makes sense on one spectrum. I'll say why. So say a disaster hits, like an earthquake. The cutting-edge communication system that were so effective uh, suddenly go down. Cell phone service is crippled. Electricity isn't available. Forget WhatsApp. It's impossible to connect. Here he just talks about, I'm just going to skip over this. Here he talks about how ham radios were used when Hurricane Katrina was hit, when Hurricane Maria, because all the electricity went down. And ham radios were pretty easy to use, didn't require much electricity. You could just crank them and then they could uh, communicate and it actually saved a lot of people's lives. So he's com he's comparing a ham radio to Bitcoin during the total economic collapse. And he says, like Bitcoin, ham, is, ham radio is anti-fragile. Ham radio operators are independent nodes. Working together, they can create a functioning decentralized peer-to-peer -peer communication system. Ham radios are light, energy efficient, rest reliable on vulnerable centralized systems. And like the Bitcoin network, a ham radio has plenty of redundancy. If one node isn't operating, others will still be monitoring channels. Just like if one node out of the 10,500 nodes goes down, not a big deal. We can just keep going, right? And then moving on, he talks about, look, he goes, th the reason why Bitcoin's going to make it is because when everything goes down and people like Venezuela and, and Nigeria start to use it more and more, which they are right now, and then it kind of spreads to the, to the rest of the world, which I don't think it's going to happen. It just... I don't think I don't think Bitcoin is there for like the total economic collapse of the dollar. I just don't see that happening. Then he says, here's another clue. People who sell salvia, a product with hallucinogenic properties that's legal in some U.S. states, are prohibited from accepting credit cards. They take Bitcoin instead. Same thing with uh, cannabis here in the United States. It's a it's a weird thing. Uh, the federal government uh, still says it's a level one controlled substance, just like heroin, which is ridiculous. So, uh, but individual states have legalized it, uh, so they can't. So the federal is one side, states are one side, and they can't get banks to uh, open up accounts and store their money. So, I believe some do take Bitcoin, not for sure, but a lot of just take cash, and they have to hide it and make sure no one robs them <laughs> with all the cash they have in the registers. So it's just pretty much awful. And then lastly, to sum it all up, he pretty much gives the worst case scenario. He says, it's good to have decentralized backups. However, as Jill Carlson has suggested, we shouldn't want to live in a world where these backups have found mainstream usage. If five years from now, everyone uh, became a ham radio operator, that could only be due to a natural disaster that has permanently crippled our infrastructure. Likewise, if five years from now, hyper Bitcoinization has occurred and everyone has become a Bitcoiner, it will be due to some sort of yet unknown calamity. And that's uh, would just knock us back to the Stone Ages, essentially. You have to understand that uh, I think some people truly believe that Bitcoin will only uh, make its way if everything totally collapses and that's it. And that's not the narrative that we should be spitting out because who wants to live in the Mad Max Thunderdome crazy world? Nobody does. But I got to tell you, it was a pretty fun article to go over and just kind of, you know, go with those different little points. And it kind of leads me to this, this next point uh, about gold, because if you kind of replaced Bitcoin with gold in here, you kind of do the same thing as, as far as the heart of the matter. And this was a question that was posed uh, to me by a subscriber. They said, well, what's the intrinsic value of Bitcoin? Because the intrinsic value of gold, I mean, you can sell, you can uh, have gold for jewelry. True. You can have gold uh, used as like a super con or a, as a conductor on motherboards for computers. True. Uh, so what is the intrinsic value of gold? And I got to answer that with, I have to answer a question with a question, which is what's the intrinsic value of fiat? Because really it's just a bunch of paper. It doesn't, it's not as valued as the paper it is printed on. Uh, what's also the intrinsic value of Tesla stock? Or what's the intrinsic value of, uh, this really gets to it, what's the intrinsic value of life insurance or medical insurance? Because on its surface, it's just insurance. And it really comes down to the definition of what intrinsic actually is or intrinsic value actually is. Before I talk about that, I would just say this. I think the new savings account in, a, in the world should be gold, silver, Bitcoin. It only makes sense to me because if you're saving money, that's a bad setup because you're losing 2% because the inflation rate. So you're just losing money as it just sits in there. So why don't you make the money work for you and put into assets such as gold, silver, Bitcoin. Anyhow, getting into you know what actually intrinsic value means, uh, let's 
to get the definition. In finance, intrinsic value or fundamental value is the true, inherent, and essential value of an asset independent of its market value. So then if you want to get even deeper, uh, intrinsic value is a philosophical concept. Um, whether the worth of an object or endeavor is derived in and of itself or independent of other extraneous factors, a company's stock also is capable of holding intrinsic value outside of what its perceived market price is, and it's often touted as an important aspect to consider by value investors. So if you want to take a look at uh, what the intrinsic value of gold, sure, you can do that. Uh, fiat, okay, it's just paper. A value as far as a stock, I mean, we can go over all this, but I'm not going to, it's super long and boring. But the big thing that I see is, what is the intrinsic value of, let's say, insurance, especially medical insurance or life insurance? And this was a question I thought about after I watched an old video from Shamath Pilihapataya. Uh, he's a Bitcoin OG, and at one point owned like a million Bitcoin, him and his partner, I guess. And uh, he just said, look, it's insurance. That's exactly what it is. And I, and when I first saw it, I didn't really get it. But now after I've seen it like three or four times in different little aspects, I get now what the value of Bitcoin is and could potentially be. So let's just take a listen real quick. I was actually down at about 9,000 when I, when I realized that distributed ledgers probably imbue more inherent value on, on something than, 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 I, uh, than a government. We've does. had this conversation for five well, or six years. I didn't years. listen I'll, to you back then. I'll say the same <laughs> I thing I said six years ago when it was at 80 bucks a coin, which is it is the single best hedge against the traditional financial infrastructure. Whether you support fiscal and monetary policy or not, it doesn't matter if this is the schmuck insurance you have under your mattress. And I that's kind of by I've default. Had it for a long I, I'm time. looking at it now at, at a point where if anything actually has inherent value, that distributed ledgers and decentralization and peer-to-peer -peer and no double payment, that, that's worth more than the current things that we use right now. You're just using it as default. Do you see what I'm saying? Though? You may end up being a spokesman for like some IBM commercial with that. <laughs> so maybe true. Just buy the coins. I mean, it's a fantastic instrument just in case. So, yeah, I get it. I mean, he talks about it like it is. I mean, if you want to take a look at and depending on what you see it as, everybody can see it as a different thing. But I can see it now as definitely insurance or a hedge against the traditional market, especially with all the quantitative easing that's going on and all the craziness that is happening in the traditional space. So um, if you're talking to somebody about it and you're talking about you know the intrinsic value, like, well, it's insurance, just like you have medical insurance or life insurance, it protects you against all the different craziness that is going on out there. And I think in today's age, you're gonna need it. And then that's, that's Shamath. And then also there was a great wow. interview on the Unchained podcast, and we had covered this before, but I wanna go over it one more time. And this is why, uh, again, these are two heavyweights. This is Mike Novogratz from Galaxy Digital. Uh, that's Raul Powell looking a little, uh, well, I fr froze him, he looks a little goofy there. But uh, he's a macroeconomist, and they're gonna talk about what's gonna drive adoption and people getting into Bitcoin, and it's totally true. But I'm wondering, like, so what is it that's driving those decision makers? Um, like, what is it about Bitcoin that makes them think that this is the investment to make now during the time of the coronavirus? Is it just as simple as, like, Bitcoin is scarce and we're about to see unlimited quantitative easing? Or is there anything kind of more? It's just that simple. <laughs> well, like, so people ask me all the time, I, I bought more gold yesterday even. And so I, I own gold and silver as well. But why Bitcoin versus gold? If you want to buy gold, there's 16 different ways to do it. It's very easy, and you can pick up and you buy an ETF. And so there's no adoption curve in gold. Where Bitcoin, there's still an adoption curve, right? A small portion of the institutional world has participated yet. And so as that adoption grows, you've just got a, a jacked up upside versus gold. Bitcoin really is going to disrupt one, one, one thing, right? The crypto universe was going to disrupt everything. Uh, Bitcoin really right now is being bet on to disrupt, disrupt central banks. And so the fact that, you know, backed or fidelity or real institutions are going to hold it for you and custody it. Uh, some of the crypto junkies would be like, dude, that's not even the whole spirit of crypto, right? The spirit of crypto was to get away from those institutions. Well, in a meta sense, yes. But in a specific sense, the bet on Bitcoin is a, is a hedge versus fiat. So it's disrupting one piece. And so I think having those trusted names in and around uh, keeping someone's Bitcoin safe. I mean, it's shocking, you know, like it's because it, it's almost comical when when you originally started telling the story of this is going to be a disruption for the banking system. 
but can I keep it at JP Morgan? <laughs> That's a good point. So, I mean, all these different things. I see Bitcoin as the first. I think that it'll be the first one because it's on the it's on the it's on the minds of everybody. It's like you got to get that Netscape browser out first to have everybody experience the internet before you can get Google Chrome, before you can get the Brave browser and really start running. That's my thoughts. Let me know what you think in the comment section, but that's it for today. I know it went a little bit long, I apologize, but I just thought it was fascinating the way it was all laid out and you know the points have to be kind of uh, made, so hopefully it helps you out. And that's why I talk about you know my Bitcoin elevator pitch. I, I think when you're talking to your friends and family as time goes on, you have to kind of keep it concise and not go crazy and go over and start talking about decentralizations and fungibility and all that nonsense. I mean, it's great if you got somebody who's like, you know, really advanced, but if you just want to make it simple, just tell them this. Bitcoin's digital gold. I know some people say, well, it's not gold. Just frame a reference. Remember, we're trying to get as many people as we can in here because it's going to help them in the long run. Uh, it's scarce. You only get 21 million and it's market insurance like Chamath was talking about. Unlike gold, you can send it to anyone within minutes, right? Six transactions, about 60 minutes, about an hour or so. And you can send it for next to nothing. And I talk about next to nothing. There was a story not too long ago, about a year, where a Bitcoin whale moved almost half a billion uh, for less than 400 bucks. So try doing that with gold. Good luck. Uh, it's the best performing asset class ever. We just talked about that. It's better than gold, oil, or any stock ever. It used to be worth five cents. Now it's worth 10,000 bucks or whatever it is when you're talking about it. And that's why I'm heavily invested. So if you just keep it simple, uh, people like simple and they can actually understand it. So that is it for today. So thanks so much for watching. I appreciate it. I'd like to give a shout out to all the supporters. So level one, appreciate you guys. Thanks so much. Level two, uh, all right, soft, win mullet, myself, who else? Dave Plummer, Grant Sharman, Bruce Wood, Baking Benjamins, Noel Flippin' Vegas, Martin Lewin, Michael Ralph, William Howell, Crazy Crypto Canuck, Tessie Ryosaki Positive, Truck, JC Durex, Matt Slack, John Miller, The Office, El Merg, Michael Jeffrey, The Kell Show, Andrew Herrera, Terry Prospery, XRP Carolina, whatever, AE, and Hero Soap Company, they make soap. And that's it. And just remember, my email is Dan Digital Asset News with an S. If you get one from Dan Digital Asset New, that's a scammer. So put them in the junk or scam folder. And that's it. All right. Thanks a lot. I'll see you on the next one. That's all.